Right. Welcome everyone to the theoretical and computational biophysics seminar. So I'm very happy to see again we have people in person here in the conference room with this there. So hopefully we are making a permanent transition from the online model to the mostly in person. So today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Professor Dr. Matthias Hayden from Arizona State University as our speaker. Matthias is a native of Germany, and he did his initial preparation as a biochemist at in Bochum, you know, uh, Ruhr University in Bochum. So he got his uh, BS, master's, and PhD there, working actually experimentally on the role of water in different biochemical systems. And then after that, so he came here to the States uh, as a postdoc to work with our colleague, Dr. Tobias, that many of you know him at the University of California, Irvine. And he continued to work on water, this time now working on actually how water affects protein dynamics and interacting with vibration proteins and so on and so forth. Then he went back to Germany. He joined the Max Planck Institute as a junior professor in the group of water field. And then, uh, so staying there for a few years, and before he actually got recruited in Arizona State University, the School of Molecular Sciences, which many of you know as the Department of Chemistry <laughs> at Arizona State University. So he has worked with a range of classical and quantum mechanical treatment of molecular systems. But in short, Matthias is, a, is an expert in water. So he really knows water inside out, how it behaves, how it interacts with biomolecular systems, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and then recently, as you can see from the title, so he got interested in molecular crowding and how water can actually affect um, this process. So he is very well funded already uh, from NIH, NSF, multiple grants, I noticed in your resume. And uh, he has received quite a few awards that I don't want to go through them to waste your time. So thank you very much for coming all the way to Urbana Champagne, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you Please. very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I thank you very much for the invitation, Yvonne. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's like feels like the mecca of the visa relations a little bit. Like all of us, we use the tools that are kind of originated here, which is amazing. Thank you for Taurus for organizing everything as well. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, talk to you all and to learn a lot about the scientific projects during this a couple of meetings that I have today. And I'm going to talk about something which sounds like a very broad topic, and it is. It's kind of three different stories, and I hope I get to all of them. For molecular vibrations, which are actually a tool that already interests me since my PhD days. So you will see in a second what kind of vibrations I'm talking about. Probably not the ones that most of you are thinking about. As well as molecular crowding, there is kind of a broader arc that connects all these things. So first of all, when I talk about molecular vibrations, I'm actually thinking about very, very low frequency vibrations. And if I say low frequency, I kind of have to tell you what high frequency is as well. Um, for that, I like to use the spectrum of water. As you might mention, I actually worked on water quite a bit. So for me, this is a good reference frame. But I guess most of you are familiar with the IR spectrum of water as well. So that should be kind of the home base. So when people talk about molecular vibrations, they typically think about stuff like this. Don't stare at them too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, the symmetric and asymmetric stretch at like 3,000, 4,000 wave numbers, or not quite 4,000. The deformation band at like 1,600. Um, this is what we typically measure spectroscopically. This is the mid infrared. This is where you see all these vibration modes. But I'm actually thinking about the very low frequency part, which in water actually is kind of interesting. You have this broad band over here, which is well, kind of interesting. These are vibrations of water molecules that want to move around. This one is something that kind of uh, that was an nemesis of my PhD. This peak is actually due to the hydrogen bonds in water. So everything that is special in water is due to the hydrogen bond network. And these are the vibrations of that network. So it's kind of cool. Mm. So that's what I mean with low frequency. And why do I like the low frequency part way more than the high frequency part? It basically goes back to statistical mechanics and the partition function. Because if you calculate the partition function for oscillators, harmonic oscillators at arcinal frequency, then you can see that here the population of the states, kind of an animation running through the vibrations or vibrational frequencies, 
at low frequencies, you have you're populating many, many, many different states. This is just the energy over here and basically the life, the length of these line healthy population. And for all the high frequency vibrations, already at a few hundred wave numbers, you're just populating the ground state. That's where you are. There's not enough energy in the system at room temperature to excite vibrations via molecular collisions. So they only get excited if you actually have light. If you have a laser and you shine laser light on the system with the right frequency, then you excite these vibrations. Otherwise, they're basically dead. And you can see that in the partition function, with the logarithm partition function, how that decays very quickly as a function of frequency. You can also calculate the entropy of these vibrations. Um, it's just a static exercise. You can see how that decays as well. So there's basically no permanent information in any vibrations which are at a thousand wave numbers at the bottom. But there's a lot of information in the low frequency vibrations. Another way to think of that is if you look at actual potentials where things vibrate. So this is a typical potential of a chemical bond. And there, anomalicity comes into play as well. So this is a potential you see it here on the energy axis, many tens of kT. So this is something that at room temperature, you're not breaking too much energy. And as you mentioned before, you're basically stuck in the ground state. This is for population over here. And if you're only stuck in the ground state, you see the harmonic approximation over here, the actual anharmonic potential. If you're stuck in the ground state, there's really basically no difference between these two. It doesn't really matter if you use an harmonic approximation or not. But if you change the energy axis a little bit, so now you're talking about non covalent interactions, the shape is more or less the same, but now you're actually populating all these states. And now it makes a big difference if you're talking about the harmonic approximation of the potential, which is, of course, really just a toy model if you want. And you see, if you look at the population of these states, and this now looks very different from the real potential, where you actually see that bond extends as a function of energy. If you have more energy in the system, you explore these different states. Now, of course, it becomes even more important if the potential looks like that, and there's something else on the other side. So with these kinds of potentials, anomalicity, basically the deviations from this harmonic model, they become extremely important. So when you use molecular dynamic simulations and you want to look at vibrations, there are different ways of doing that. And during the talk, I will touch upon three different ways how you can look at vibrations. And the first one has something to do with basically also another step max standard problem, time correlation functions. So a way how you can analyze vibrations is to look at fluctuations. For example, you look at the velocities of the different atoms. You can see as a function of time, they're fluctuating quite a bit. You can see they kind of oscillate at particular frequencies. You calculate a time correlation function from those, and you Fourier transform it, and you get a spectrum. So this is the spectrum of vibrations in your system. We call it vibrational density of states. Effectively, what it means is how kinetic energy is distributed over frequencies in the system. So if you integrate the spectra overall, it basically tells you the total amount of kinetic energy and a canonical ensemble per degree of freedom this is fixed. So basically, this is proportional to the number of degrees of freedom that you have in your system. That's basically information that is in there. But you see this vibrational spectrum. It kind of has similar properties as an IR spectrum or a Raman spectrum. The only thing that we don't care about here is IR activity. So we don't care about transition dipole moments or any of the selection rules that you have to follow in spectroscopy. Do you see these vibrations or not? The vibrations exist nevertheless. There's kinetic energy in these degrees of freedom. So this is a pretty straightforward way that you, once you have an MD simulation directory, you have dynamics, you calculate these fluctuations, you calculate the Fourier transform, you get a spectrum. No approximations used here, apart from the model that you use for a simulation, of course. The problem about it is that even though this is a correct spectrum, this doesn't tell you what these vibrations actually are. I already told you that this bump here at 200 weight numbers this is the hydrogen bond network, for example. Well, I tell you that, but how do you figure that out? So this technique doesn't tell you that. Already, this vibration latency of states can actually tell you a lot. I mentioned when I showed you the partition functions that there's actually a lot of thermodynamic information in these low frequency vibrations. This is straight over to write out for harmonic oscillators, but we also know that these vibrations actually are not harmonic at all. They have all the anomalies that you can think about. So this is not the right way to think about that. But there are ways to extract this information. And where we use that in particular is in the context of solvent mediated or water mediated interactions. So all of you know what your hydrophobic effect is, obviously. And this is a water mediated interaction. Uh, there are two molecules in solution, they 
form a contact with each other, they're fine. And partially because of the interaction between A and B themselves. Okay. But they also form a complex in part because of how they interact with water around them. And thermodynamically, you express that either as a difference between the binding to energy in solution and the binding to energy in vacuum, or because of the thermodynamics, the cycle has to close. You can also look at the difference of the solvation free energies. So the solvation free energy is nothing else but the free energy involved of transferring these molecules from vacuum or technically the gas phase, ideal gas phase, into solution. And if you do that for the separate molecules and you do that for complex solvation free energies are different. And that difference is that basically quantifies what the solvent media interaction is, the change in free energy. So one way to study that is to study solvation free energies. And for that, we developed a tool already a while ago um, that we not only calculate solvation free energies, it's kind of relatively boring just to use a least simulation to calculate numbers, at least. <laughs> I think just getting a number as a result is always very frustrating. But um, we run a simulation where we split the whole environment. This is a little protein, can be something else. It's sitting right here, still in the middle, but it can move around as well. We can track that. And we take the environment, we split it into little voxels using a grid. Actually, grid is much finer than what you see here, just made it a little bit bigger, so that's not too confusing. And then for every voxel, we calculate the properties of water. We calculate the interaction energy terms, the interaction energy with, for example, water molecules in this voxel and the proteins. So their interaction, but we wait long enough and sample long enough until everything converges. We do the same thing for the water-water interaction energies. Overall, that gives us information about enthalpy in the system, particularly differences between water molecules in the bulk and water molecules in the hydration environment of the protein. That is pretty straightforward. It's not rocket science. It's just re-evaluating these potential energy terms of your force field. But the question is, how do you get entropy information? That is kind of the difficult part. There are different solutions out there trying to address that, but the way we are doing this, no big surprise, is we use low frequency vibrations. So we calculate for each water molecule in each of these voxels the velocity time correlation function. We treat the translations and the rotation separately. Once we have these correlation functions, we fully transform them, we get the spectra. And to get that sample for like one angstrom sized voxels, we need a few nanoseconds at most. So what do we do with that? We have now for every little voxel in our system, we have a nice spectrum with vibrational density of states. How do we extract permanent information from that? And for that, we borrow an idea that Bill Gordon had already 20 years ago, originally just for Leonard Jones liquids, but then later as a molecular liquids, and that's called two phase thermodynamics. The idea is that you take the vibrational density of states and you describe it with two different liquids, or actually one liquid and one solid, that are not really there. These are just theoretical models. But it's an ad hoc approach, but it doesn't have three parameters. One of them describes all the diffusion in your system. And the diffusion is information that you find at zero frequency. Diffusion is not an oscillatory process. Diffusion is your random walk in the system, which has basically no frequency component to it. That is directly proportional to this vibrational density of state at zero frequencies. And that you describe as a hard sphere fluid. This hard sphere fluid has to have certain properties, it has to have this the same density as your real liquid. There are a few other conditions. In the end, it also describes, you can calculate the vibrational spectrum of this hard sphere fluid. It does have a vibrational spectrum, even though there are no vibrations in it, because it's hard spheres, there's no attraction in here, but you have diffusion and you have visualization terms over here. So that describes now a fraction of your spectrum. As I've mentioned before, the integral of your spectrum is nothing else but how many degrees of freedom do you have. So it describes a fraction of your degrees of freedom. And, oh, I did not do that. Sorry. Okay. okay. Since it's a theoretical model, see what you uh, Something gross. Okay, now we are there, I think. Since it's a theoretical model, um, for the hard sphere fluid, you can calculate everything in a degree. You can calculate the thermodynamic properties, whatever you want. So you can also calculate this entropy. So that's now the entropy of the fraction of the degrees of freedom. And now you have the rest. This remaining part of your spectrum by construction has no diffusion anymore. And that makes it essentially a solid. And this remaining part of your spectrum at every frequency, it basically tells you how many oscillators they are. You treat that as harmonic oscillators. So this is kind of a crappy way of thinking about your real liquid. There are two kind of model systems, neither of them are your real liquid. 
but they are basically represented with two extremes that you put in compound. Could the position of these hard spheres could they follow the position? Oh, of just an animation. Oh no! Oh, what in reality when you apply this model? Did they, did they follow the position of all the models? No, they don't. It's just a completely independent. It's completely independent. You actually never. This is just animation to illustrate what the hard sphere fluid looks like. Um, you're not actually generating a directory of hard sphere fluids. You're just using the mathematical tools to okay, find hard sphere fluids. I see. I see. I see. Okay. And the same thing for harmonic oscillators. Mm -hmm. So this is really just this is just for animating, see, for visualizing purposes. Right. right. But um, so we have to have two analytic models that describe two different, completely different things. The hard sphere fluid has a very high entropy in comparison to your real liquid. Mm -hmm. The harmonic oscillators have a very low entropy because everything is stuck in place. And your real liquid is kind of in between these two. By construction, that's what you get. It's not a perfect description of your entropy, but if you try it for many different molecular liquids, you actually get mm -hmm. plus minus 10% of the absolute entropy of these different liquids. So it's actually working pretty well. Plus minus 10% is not perfect. You definitely have a systematic error in it, but we don't really care because when we try to describe solvation thermodynamics, we actually look at differences. We look at the properties of water in the bulk and water in vibration shell. And if you look at differences, systematic errors basically cancel out. So it becomes extremely accurate. We try to for many small molecules to be thrown water, but we have excellent data to compare it, and we all get different kind of the accuracy of the pulse field. That's kind of neat. And what it gives us in the end is basically this three-dimensional map of contributions to the salvation chain. And it can now resolve in space where water molecules contribute to the salvation entropy, to the salvation entropy, obviously also to the salvation free energy, and then gives us a 3D map, which is kind of nice. So the different colors tell you how much water molecules contribute to the salvation free energy. Blue tells you essentially nothing. This is lysocycle away. So hydrogen atom of proteins essentially. Now everywhere there's blue. Water molecules are there, obviously. There. That's the first hydration channel that I'm showing you here. But if you want to push them away, if you're a ligand, you're something else that wants to bind there, these water molecules just you know, don't resist. Mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> Everywhere where it's green and red, this is where you have to pay. You actually have to do some work to convince water molecules to go somewhere else. That's kind of neat. And one of the projects we applied for many, many things mm -hmm. is to try to understand water mediated interactions in the context of proton complexes. Uh, Barney's Barca is again the standard system that people look at. And what I like about Barney's Barca is if you look at the crystal structures, and especially if you start running in these simulations, we flip it a little bit more, look at the interface, and there's water everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you look in detail, most of the contacts between these two proteins are actually not direct, they're water mediated. It looks completely insane. And this is one of the strongest protein protein complexes that we know of. So it almost looks like water is acting like a glue between these two proteins. Turns out that's not true, but it's a good thing to, to start with to motivate students like, hey, is water actually a glue in there? <laughs> so what we did is we calculated the salvation for energy maps of a complex as a function of distance between these two proteins. We slowly pulled it apart. This is actually a project that is run by 30 online students. So ASU has a very big online biochemistry program. They are online, they're actually distributed all over the world. So participating in research is a little bit harder, but they can then do computational research, which is why I like it. And this is a nice project that you can split up into many, many calculations at different distances. That's exactly what we did. So again, all this different information, I'm going to walk you through it. But what you can see is that the salvation free energy is actually going down when you pull them apart. So water is not acting as a glue. It's actually the opposite. The two proteins like to be solvated separately. Mm -hmm. So if you pull them apart, the solvation energy goes down. They like to interact with water. You actually have to perform work to get these proteins together to desolvate them. Just the very last layer doesn't go away. That wants to stay there. That sounds weird. Uh, if you calculate what the change in the solvation reaction in the reactor is, it becomes weirder. The number is astronomical, plus 1,700 kilojoules per mole. That is weird, but if you calculate the direct electrostatic and thunderbolts interaction between the two proteins, that's a part that compensates for it. So you have these huge terms which are compensating for each other. But what really keeps this complex together and what makes it the strongest complex or one of the strongest com protein complexes that we know are really electrostatic interactions. In the end, not very surprised. But we really were interested, like, so weird that this interface is so full of water, which doesn't go away, but it's not acting as a glue. It's just the last buffer that you cannot kind of 
So it's a tool. Uh, it's called 3 d 2 pt If you can barely see here, it's on GitHub. It's free, so you can play around with it if you want. We applied it for many, many different things. You looked at small molecules and their salvation, proteins and, and, and solution, little peptides and transmitted all the proteins. We also looked at salvation and lipid fields. So if you polarize the environment, you polarize the solvent, you actually change the solvent properties, which is kind of interesting. And it's, I think, one of the uh, um, fundamental contributions to protein dialectophoresis, which is an actual mental method, which technically allows you to manipulate proteins with very fine detail. But I'm not going to talk about all of them. Just these are basically this was our bread and butter for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Quick summary. So we can use 3 d 2 pt to generate these salvation free energy maps for binding molecules to complexes, mm -hmm. even relatively large systems. It allows you to quantitatively analyze water medium fractions, which are otherwise kind of hard to quantify. Usually nobody can tell you what the strength of the water mediated hydrogen bond is. We can. Um, we can analyze the driving forces of the formation of complexes or transformational changes solution. You can, as I mentioned, you can measure the strength of water mediated hydrogen bonds uh, and many other things. Mm -hmm. Now, this was basically about solution and water and everything around the proteins, but low frequency vibrations also occur in proteins themselves. And I always found it very, very kind of frustrating that we have no good way of analyzing what these vibrations are. First of all, well, are there low frequency vibrations in proteins? I kind of already gave away the answer. These are vibrational spectra calculated from simulations of two, two proteins, the trip cage mini protein, which is just 20 amino acids. It's like the smallest protein you can think of. Again, lysozyme, if you calculate vibration in your states, you get these huge peaks in the low frequency part of the spectrum. They are very featureless, which means basically there's lots of vibrations, all at very similar frequencies. It's hard to distinguish them from each other. You see from the color code, which is basically again your partition function, how many states you actually have. So it's the logarithm, so you have a lot of states. And then you can go to higher frequencies, you see it's getting white. So there's you're not populating anything else but the ground state. But these guys are all excited, they are all exploring the potential energy surface. These are the vibrations that actually make a protein flexible. These are the vibrations that bear the reason why we have to actually simulate a protein. <laughs> we have to simulate and observe what the protein does as a function of time. If that would, if they would be all here, then they would just sit there and do nothing. Or we could just explain everything what a protein does in terms of normal modes. That's not the case. So yes, there are low frequency vibrations and proteins. So this is simulation or experiment? This is simulation. simulation. So this is vibrations you're saying to these velocity fluctuations. Yeah, sure. Which so far at least don't tell us what the emotions are. Mm -hmm. So why do we care? Um, well, I don't have to explain you this time scale of the different motions and dynamics. Of course, we care about what happens on microsecond time scales. These are Basically, non oscillatory stochastic motions, so basically diffusion of a protein on some free energy surface that we don't know yet. Um, that's what we want to go to. Right now, the only way to do that is basically to run very <coughs> long simulations and using a lot of computational power. If you go to very, very short time scales, you start looking at vibrations. At the shortest time scales, you would look at the mid infrared vibrations that are relatively harmonic, but also kind of boring because they just stay in their ground state at room temperature. But already when you go to 0.1, 1 picoseconds, you're entering the far infrared part of the spectrum, where the vibrations are excited, thermally excited. And we already, the only way to look at those is to run a simulation to observe. You have no good tools to kind of find them. And even if you look at them in simulation, there's no good way to extract these simulations and to extract these vibration motions to figure out what is actually going on there so far. Another concept, especially if you're used to vibrational motions and how to analyze them, is that in these simulations, or overall when you simulate dynamics, vibrational motions are not constant over time, which basically every method based on harmonic oscillators usually kind of tries to tell you that you have harmonic normal modes and they are there all the time. It's always the same ones. It doesn't work like that if you have non harmonic system. You can see in this very simple potential energy service, for example, if you are down in this low minimum, this is wider. So your vibrational frequencies are actually at a low frequency. If you jump over the barrier and this minimum, which is more narrow, the vibrations are at higher frequency. So even in this one-dimensional system, which can be whatever, can be confirmation of change of the proton or whatever, you already see that the vibrations are qualitatively changing. In one dimension, the direction cannot change, but you can see that the frequency is changing depending on which state you are in. 
what part of your potential energy service are you currently populating? So that's another thing that a method that analyzes these low frequency vibrations should take into account that vibrations are changing over time. So then you Google vibrations of molecules and how to figure out how they work, or you follow any kind of tutorials, you will probably find that. Harmonic normal modes is usually how they are analyzed. And probably not tell you how it works, but if you look at basically a second order Taylor expansion of your potential energy around ideally a minimum of your potential energy surface. If you do that in many dimensions, your second derivatives actually look like a matrix, and you calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. The eigenvalues, depending on how you construct the problem, are either related to the force constants or to the frequencies of the vibrations, and the eigenvectors are displacement vectors relative to your reference structure that tell you distortions. Like this is, these are the collective variables basically that describe these vibrations that are supposed to happen at fixed frequencies if your system actually is harmonic. To do that for small molecules, you get these beautiful images. The arrows basically describe these as portions. This is like an ammonia, a small molecule. These are all these molecular mid infrared vibrations. So that actually works pretty well. You get the trouble a little bit if you have degeneracies, if you have more vibrations that are happening at the same frequency, this, this procedure cannot really disentangle them. You have to apply symmetry and sort them down. But overall, this works quite well. Once you go to low frequencies or you look at anharmonic systems, this can fail pretty miserably. And this is very difficult to understand if you look at a high dimensional system like a protein or something like this. So, the way I do it, also to explain it to myself, is to look at a very simple system, just a two dimensional system, which is fantasy. This is just a potential energy surface in two dimensions. What is nice about that is you can run a simulation on it, you can run dynamics on it, um, you can look at everything, everything is clear. And the potential energy surface, as you can see here, is pretty simple. There's a minimum, it's actually a single minimum, it has this kind of extra value over here, so it's really unharmonic. And if you run dynamics on it and you calculate the velocities as a function of time, you get one for the coordinate one and coordinate two. You can calculate the velocity fluctuations, you can calculate the spectrum. The total spectrum in black and the spectrum will be separate coordinates. And you can see the spectrum is already pretty complicated. Even though the system only has two dimensions, the spectrum actually has many peaks. And now the challenge is to figure out what are these peaks. I mean, obviously, you get two different spectra for coordinate one and coordinate two, but they don't really tell you what each peak is. Like in some cases, it's mostly coordinate two, and it's mostly coordinate one, but it's still a mixture of those. That is not a clear answer. So if you try to use harmonic normal modes, so you go to the minimum of the potential, you calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix, get these two vectors, and then you calculate the spectrum for these two orthogonal degrees of freedom. You project your dynamics onto these two different modes. Again, again two separate spectra. Actually doesn't help you explaining what these modes are. You can go to any peak in here and it doesn't tell, oh, it's a mixture of mode one and mode two. That's not a great answer. We do that with other methods, principal component analysis, or technically this is what I'm doing with quasi harmonic mode analysis, slightly differently, but based on the covariance matrix of positions. Um, same thing, it worked a little bit better. Actually, two peaks maybe you can actually assign. This is mostly mode two, this is mostly mode one, but everything else is still a mixture. So that kind of shows you already the number of signals that you have, that you have more peaks in your spectrum than you have degrees of freedom, tells you that any method that is based on these orthogonal sets of modes, harmonic normal modes, quasi-harmonic normal modes, whatever, they cannot work. There has to be more. You have many more vibrations than you have degrees of freedom because the system evolves as a function of time. It occupies different parts of your potential energy service. <clears throat> so one method that many of you may be familiar with, instantaneous normal modes, is kind of taking that into account. You try to sample the potential energy service in many different places and look at local minima. That wouldn't work here either because the system actually only has one minimum. So that wouldn't really work. But you're still using this harmonic approximation, which is still a problem, even in these methods. Mm. So there's a third method. Um, that's what we came up with. It's based on a time correlation formalism. Again, I call it frequency selected anharmonic mode analysis. I'm not very good at making acronyms. <laughs> um, obviously, I am on a little bit more. <laughs> uh, it sounds a little bit like Friesian, which is a northern part of Germany and the Netherlands. If I actually breed these horses, I like to associate animals with them. But that's essentially this is the third way how you can analyze vibrations now. So this is based on our method. And this is how it works. 
So it's again based on a time correlation formalism using velocity. So we look at velocity and velocity fluctuations. What you do is you take every degree of freedom, so every Cartesian degree of freedom, at the one moving in x direction, at the one moving in y direction, and so on and so on. For each degree of freedom, we calculate the fluctuations and then the correlations, but not just with itself, but between all the degrees of freedom. That gives you a matrix, which is not just a 3n by 3n matrix for all of your degrees of freedom, but it's also time dependent because you calculate the time correlation functions between all degrees of freedom. And after you have that, you do a Fourier transform for every matrix element, which gives you in the end this 3n by 3n matrix, which is now frequency dependent. So kind of imagine it like a cube or kind of a three dimensional object. That's kind of a weird object to think about, but we are not the first ones to ever look at it. Uh, this idea comes from um, Gerhard Matthias and Marcel Dare, and their idea is how to use this kind of weird representation of the frequency of states, because the diagonal elements of this matrix are the autocorrelation terms. That's exactly what we analyzed before when we calculated the vibration in the states. If you sum up the diagonal elements, you get your vibration in the states, your vibrational spectrum. Now, in this matrix form, what they try to do is to find the transformation that diagonalizes with matrix at all frequencies at the same time to find one set of orthogonal modes that describes the variations of your system. It's actually pretty cool. They have a very nice algorithm to try to do that. But in the end, you try to project all vibrations in your system on one set of orthogonal modes. I showed you before that that doesn't really work. So we did something else. And in the beginning, it sounded like a crazy idea to use this matrix and to calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues at every single frequency. The reason why this sounds stupid is that for every frequency, you get a different set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you different, get a different set of modes. And how many frequencies you sample depends on you. So we basically get an infinite number of, mm -hmm. of vibrations. That's not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't really tell you anything. However, if you actually do it, it turns out that it kind of the whole problem fixes it itself. You just have to do it. Mathematically, the key information, the key piece of information is that well before your diagonalization, the sum of the diagonal terms was the description of your vibration in the states. Now, any orthogonal transformation doesn't change that. So so-called unitary informations, they don't change the so-called trace of your matrix. So before the diagonal terms to so describe the vibrational spectrum, after the diagonalization, you have diagonal matrices, you have all eigenvalues. The sum of the eigenvalues describes exactly the same thing. And that gives the eigenvalues meaning, meaning that at every frequency, the eigenvalues tell you now the contributions of each of the corresponding eigenvectors to the vibrational spectrum of your system. It becomes clearer when you actually look at it for a simple system like this 2D system over here. So we have our very complicated vibrational spectrum. What we can do now, we have our frequency dependent matrix, and we go to our matrix at every individual frequency that we want to understand. We have these different features in our spectrum, for example, this peak or this little shoulder. We go to the matrix at that frequency, and we look at its eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that frequency. And what we get is obviously two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues because it's a two dimensional system. One of the eigenvalues is larger than zero. And mathematically, it's actually identical to the intensity of vibration of states. The other eigenvalue is zero. I mentioned before, the meaning of these eigenvalues is how much does this vibrational mode contribute to the spectrum at that frequency? So you can now go to any point in your spectrum, to any frequency in your spectrum. And this method explains to you these are vibrational modes which are contributing to the spectrum and how much. In this case, you only have two. Two modes, so one mode contributes and one mode doesn't. And so eigenvalue is exactly zero. That just happened. <laughs> if you have a symmetric system, think they can. But um, it allows you to, for example, go to this lowest frequency feature that you have with the shoulder, and the corresponding eigenvalue that you get is this mode over here. I made its length proportional to the eigenvalue. So you can see that actually not, not proportional to the potential change. But you can see this, this kind of value of your potential there. You can have the have potential for large amplitude motion that is corresponding to this low frequency part of your vibrational spectrum, as you would expect, actually. And it predicts that quite nicely. You can go to any other part of your spectrum, and the corresponding errors tell you exactly what the corresponding motions are. So that wasn't possible before with any of these other methods. 
And there's no point in time that you ever imply that there are harmonic oscillators at play. You can completely avoid harmonic approximations. And that never existed before. Now, I mentioned in between that these vibrations are not looking always the same. The system is executing fluctuations on this 2D system. The vibrations are changing all the time. And that's something that you need to take into account as well. And we have a tool to do that. In order to do that, use so called wavelets. So, a wavelet is a transformation where you take fluctuations as a function of time and you transform them into frequency space. But instead of integrating over all times, you use the so-called Gaussian kernel that kind of still allows you to localize when these vibrations happen. It's kind of a hybrid between time domain and frequency domain. So what we do is we look at our simulated dynamics and we project it on each of these vibrational nodes. So it gives us oscillations as a function of time. Now we use a wave that transform to identify when did this vibration along this vibrational mode happen and when did it happen at this frequency. When you look at that as a function of time, this is you get these time traces. When did these vibrations actually occur? And they're not there all the time. This, this oscillation along this kind of long part of the potential is not happening continuously. It's happening in blips every once in a while. That's one blip, that's a second blip, that's a third blip, and so on. And you can look at the fractions of the trajectory that we simulated, and you can basically isolate one of the trajectory fragments that matches one of these blips. And this is one of these fractions. You can see how it's executing this motion. You can look at any other frequency, like any other feature of our spectrum, and analyze a blip, and you can see other motions that correspond to vibrations along these other vibrational modes that we identify, and kind of figure out what kind of motions are behind that. Now, actually, now I'm tempted, I want to do it anyways. There might be something bad. Something bad, something bad, something bad. I can show you that at the same time, <laughs> but if you have vibrations at different frequencies and you plot it as a function of time, that is nothing else but music. It doesn't really sound like music, more like space and waiters, but um, you can, this is another way of kind of visualizing or audioizing basically what is happening in your simulation. Mm. So that's kind of fun. Um, obviously, applying this question. Yeah, um, you can go to the desk, right? Sure. Um, I'm wondering what's the time scale if you know um, in the middle block. Uh, it's relevant because it's a model system. Oh, okay. So we can adjust our times and masses in any way we want. Okay. So this is just, um, this is a fraction of a factory. Our simulation is much longer than this, mm -hmm. but I only kind of isolated this part of the of, this, of the simulation factory so that you can see this in the group left cell it's too many. Okay. But it's an artificial system that you can choose it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go on. But of course, applying things to a 2D model system, it has no, no context in reality. It's kind of boring. But can we apply this? Sounds relatively complicated. In the end, it's not because idealizing a matrix is something that you have to do anyways. Now we just don't do it for one matrix, but for every frequency that you want to understand the motions for, you have to do it for them. You can do it for all of your frequencies. That may it's very parallel, which is nice. Or you do it for the frequency that you care about the most. Um, but can we do that with proteins? And I wouldn't be here if the question wouldn't be wouldn't be yes. Um, we first did it for the trip change mini proteins, of course, very small. But already there, you have 800 degrees of freedom. So you have 800 by 800 matrices. Not a big deal, to be honest. It's actually pretty quick. And you can do it for many different frequencies. Here, I just go from terahertz to terahertz, to one terahertz, about these 33 wave numbers. And you actually get answers for zero terahertz as well. Now, what I'm showing you here are the eigenvalues relative to the first one as a function of the degree of freedom and the number of the eigenvalues. And you can see that. Of course, it's more complicated now. It's not just a two-dimensional system. They have one eigenvalue that tells you everything, and the other one is zero. But you can see out of the 800 eigenvalues, only the first few are actually non zero. So you can now look at the vibrational spectrum of this protein, and for every frequency, it tells you these are the eigenvalues that belong to the corresponding eigenvectors. I can show you all of them. There are just a few examples here for one terahertz and for two terahertz. These are the vibrational modes that contribute to the spectrum at that frequency, and it's not just one mode at every frequency. This is the harmonic picture, which doesn't really apply here. Even for proteins, you have many vibration modes that have very similar frequencies, which is actually a problem. Um, here we can separate them cleanly in the first place, and it's only a few tens of them that really contribute to the spectrum at every frequency. And it's no approximations. For every frequency, you can tell you exactly what the motions are. 
people do a spectroscopy, but the thicker region, the problem is very important to assign what they actually see. So that's a method that can do that. But also, it's also important to understand what are the lowest frequency vibrations in the in the protein. These are the motions that you that describe you basically helping you to distort the structure of the protein the easiest way. We are all thinking about collective variables and stuff like this, so I don't have to explain that, but that's probably an important thing to do to figure out what is the easiest way to change the conformation of the protein. So for that, you go to the lowest frequency vibrations of the protein. And harmonic normal modes, well, these vibrations are not harmonic, so mm -hmm. why use that? So you don't include water in your diagram. Yeah, so they are. You do. So water is in here, but I'm not including water into the vibration. Analysis. Right, right. Exactly. It's they will simulation. let it in there, but then, okay. Exactly. That's the good. Is happening again? Yeah. It's not me. I think this might be the first one. Maybe this a project. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. So we could do that. Yeah. We have ways to describe the dynamics of water using density fluxes and then yeah. include that in the matrices as well. See motions of the protein that also push away water, but that's right. kind of higher level information. Right, right, right. You can do it in membrane as well, right? You can do non membrane work again. In principle, we can. Yes. Yes, we can. So you can run, of course, membrane proteins uh, and right. just look at the dynamics of the protein. But you can actually the dynamics of the, of the membrane yeah. itself. Yeah. See if uh, low frequency vibrations that involve motion in the in the yeah. okay. That'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. This is a mini protein, so this is not convincing everyone. But of course, you can do it for larger systems as well. So lysozyme again, simple proteins, but still. So now you're talking about something of two thousand something atoms, so six thousand degrees of freedom. Um, relatively large matrices, but actually we don't need to do all that work because we usually care about the low frequency vibrations in the system and spectrum again here. Um, those, if we resolve all the atoms in the protein or not, doesn't really matter. Of course, our simulation is atomistic, but for the analysis, we can cross brain everything. We can just look at the dynamics at the velocities of centers of masses of multiple atoms, like side chains or total amino acids, things like that. To understand the low frequency vibrations of the actual structure of the protein is completely not. That makes things a lot easier. Then you can reduce basically this protein with 6,000 degrees of freedom into something with a few hundred degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet, but we are on it. Mm -hmm. If you look at the eigenvalues, I'm not showing you all 6,000 of them, just the first few hundred, you see the same thing. It's very quickly drops to zero. So this method isolates the degrees of freedom. Which really contribute to the spectrum of every frequency, and it's just a handful. I mean, still a few dozen, but that's reality. That's something we can change. What we can do is we can project our simulations on each of these eigenvectors that we analyze and actually check if the fluctuations along these vibration vectors are really describing vibrations only at these frequencies. And as you can see, that actually worked quite well. We look at the eigenvectors at one terahertz and we look at fluctuations along these eigenvectors and calculate the spectrum. We get clean peaks at one terahertz. We do the same thing at two terahertz, same thing. We can look at displacements. Here, the lowest frequency parts. Zero frequency is actually a thing. We can isolate the modes to describe diffusion of the protein, not diffusion in three dimensions. We can see that too, but we can also see diffusive motions, which are actually conformational changes. Mm -hmm. Very short simulations, so we're not actually looking at large amplitude changes. But these are the degree of degrees of freedom where you can distort the conformation of the protein without any resisting force. You just push it and it moves. So that's kind of nice. What you can also look at is how these vibration modes are exchanging energy with each other, which in the harmonic picture shouldn't work. Harmonic vibrations are technically independent from each other, just reality really has a slightly different point of view. Here we're not implying that anything is harmonic, and we can actually look at the correlations between these vibrations. These are the basically the time domain versions of these matrices that I showed you before at one particular frequency. And these are the basically damped oscillations that you see in all these degrees of freedom. And in the cross terms, you see the cross correlations, how upper vibration modes at the same frequency are picking up that energy over time. And what else picks up the energy is, of course, the solvent around it. But there's also energy transfer between vibration modes. For comparison, how harmonic and quasi harmonic normal modes fare overall. We do the same thing. I'm looking now at individual modes and fluctuations along individual modes and calculating the spectra. So this is at one terahertz. And for the Friesian modes, you get at one terahertz, you get these very clean spectrum at one D at exactly one terahertz, which is broad because it's not a harmonic system. If you do the same thing for harmonic and quasi harmonic modes, you also get a bunch of modes. And some of them also have the frequency of one terahertz. Look at fluctuations for those. 
all of the peaks are more or less at the right frequency, but they're a lot lower. And that already tells you that something is going really wrong because the integrals of these peaks are supposed to be all the same. They correspond to the kinetic energy of one degree of freedom. What is going wrong is if you extend the spectrum to higher frequencies, so up to 4,000 wave numbers, you see all these additional peaks that are not supposed to be there. These harmonic and quasi-harmonic modes are supposed to describe the vibration at one terahertz. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at fluctuations along these modes, you see lots of stuff at thousands of wave numbers that, that are not supposed to be there. The only method that is actually able to isolate the low frequency vibrations in a system is the 3D mode analysis. So, a quick summary. So, if you care about low frequency vibrations, well, you should if you run simulations because that's what you're actually looking at, just on long time scales. These are the vibrations which are thermally excited. So, just collisions between molecules at room temperature are exciting these vibrations. They are exploring your potential energy surface. Eventually, they make it possible. They are highly anharmonic as well. Otherwise, it would be boring and everything would just oscillate around one state. And this is basically the first method that allows you to really analyze those without making approximations, without anything. Complex information that you get out, every frequency has many, many modes that are contributing to it. But if you want to understand your spectrum of low frequency vibrations, what's the way to do it? And if you want to know what are the degrees of freedom that allow you to distort the shape of a protein without any resisting force, just go to the zero frequency modes. And then we can also analyze your trajectories and see how your system jumps from one state to another and how vibrational modes are changing. This is trajectory of vibrational events that I played the audio file. Mm -hmm. Now, for the last part, um, kind of switch of gears. So away from low frequency vibrations, there is a connection which is kind of hidden in the in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the end. But because when we look at biomolecular crowding, what we need to describe are water medium interactions and the salvation of the energy map that I showed you in the beginning. They are one way of doing that, just at this point, extremely expensive. So we kind of try to get away with something cheaper. <clears throat> Many of you are probably familiar with this movie that comes out of Adrian Alpha group. Um, he was basically the first brave person to simulate what it looks like in an actual cell. Um, this is a rigid body Brownian dynamic simulation of the basically the interior of E. coli, but many proteins and ribosomal subunits and so on and so on. It's very cool. But one of the main limitations is that everything is a rigid body. Mm -hmm. So all the proteins are basically just PDB structures rotating and translating and bump, bumping into each other. So that's kind of a problem. Um, that's something about well, this, another extreme. And this is work by Taras and also, of course, Yuji Sugita and Michael Feig. But I'm actually working with power simulations over here to do it all at them on an Anton supercomputer. And the really, really big system, like what Yuji was supposed to do, you get hundreds of nanoseconds. So it's not enough time for proteins to actually really do stuff. You see metabolites jumping around and jumping from one molecular surface to another. But the proteins are just kind of sitting there and kind of wiggling a little bit. But if you go to hundreds of microseconds or at least tens of microseconds, you start seeing things diffusing around, changing conformation, stuff like that. Problem is, this is hard. Powers. This is really, really difficult. So you can do that. And they actually, they don't do it just once, they do it multiple times, which is really, really hard to look at the effect of the parameters and so on. But if you try to play around with the system and change parameters, like, okay, let's change the composition of the system, let's change the number of ions in the system, let's change the composition of the density packing and stuff like this. So if you want to run many, many, many of these simulations, that's just impossible. Or as you have, unless you have many, many Anton machines somewhere mm -hmm. in the basement. So during my postdoc with Dr. Tobias and Irvine, I came up with this multi, you can't really see it, it's called multi contamination Monte Carlo method. It's using the same engine as the Brownian dynamic simulations. I'll show you in a moment by the way also fast. But instead of using rigid bodies, I describe all the proteins in the system as an ensemble of structures. So effectively, instead of just translations and rotations, we have a new move. Mm -hmm. The new move is a conformational change. Mm -hmm. And this conformational change is relatively cheap to calculate because all you have to do is basically go from one conformation to another. How that works? Protein-protein interactions are calculated with these pre-computed grids. So for every protein, you pre-compute, for example, electrostatic interactions. Here you use an implicit solvent model or some Boltzmann, but you basically get this grid. It depends on the structure of your protein, but 
If you now have another atom from another protein entering this environment, you can look up its energy immediately. You don't have to loop over all the atoms anymore. This is why it's ridiculously fast. Mm. Um, you have different types of interaction, the electrostatics, something that is trying to imitate water media interaction. This is the part that we want to replace with our observation for energy maps. I'm not going to go into too much detail. You have repulsions, basically, this is like the, the atoms are, the proteins are hard, they cannot penetrate each other, they cannot be in the same place at the same time. Um, and you can pre compute all of those. Now, what we do, which is different from the rigid body approach, is we pre compute those for a whole ensemble of structures, mm. like 50 different structures of, oh. of the process. And this move is when you're simply switching these potentials. So there's an index in our memory that says, now we use this grid to calculate the energies, or this grid, or this grid. So that's all that is happening in the background. Otherwise, there's no difference. So that's kind of neat. The only limitation that you have is that you need all these grids in your memory. If you look at a system which is as complicated as the one that Powers and Martin were using, on this model of the cytoplasm, you have many different protein types. Um, that means for, let's say, 11 different types of proteins, for each of them, you have 50 confirmations. You have four different types of grids. So you need to calculate 2,200 grids overall. That's about 64 gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. So your simulation your simulation starts at the first, let's say, five minutes of reading information from your hard disk and filling your memory. So we need to do that on, on nodes that have enough memory. But 64 mm -hmm. gigabytes comes back. Not too bad, yeah. mm -hmm. What our system, the simulations after that are becoming really, really cheap. So there's actually a minimum size that we need in order to get our potentials right. So we make the system 20 size, 27 times as large as it was originally. So three by three by three in all the mechanisms. So in the end, we don't have, in this case, it was I think, 15 or 16 proteins. We have 475. Gives you a lot more statistics as well. And now the rest is cheap. All of our simulations, they need a lot of memory, but they actually run on a single core. Hmm. Of course, you could paralyze it a little bit, but it's not very efficient at the moment. But this is completely fine. On a single core in a couple of days, you sample everything you need to sample. Simulations are much longer than what you see here. This is kind of just give you a taste. But um, it's very nice. You can just run enough sampling that you get all the statistics that you need. And now you can play with parameters, external parameters, which are hard to model or modify an actual simulation. Like the overall packing density, how many proteins do we try to stop and get put in the assimilation box? What is your ionic strength? So, all of these things we, we can vary now. In this case, we simulate nine different conditions and it costs nothing, and we don't need entrance to that. And then you can analyze. Actually, gives you more data than you would like to have. <laughs> 475 proteins, all of them are sometimes seeing each other, all of them are binding to each other, but let's see how we can get. Um, you can count contacts. So if one protein has a contact with another protein, we count it. Doesn't matter what this contact looks like. So we count it as one, one contact, call it N. And we can also now quantify a little bit more what does this contact look like. Is this really just one atom of protein one and one atom of protein two kind of interacting with each other? Or is it a whole protein interface? So I basically count the atomic contacts. So in this case, it's really just one. And in this case, it's say 30. So I call that A is basically the surface area of the interface or the complex. And you can also look at the ratio of these two, which tells you whenever these two proteins are forming a complex, what is the context of this area on average? So these things we can use to analyze what is going on in the simulation. Now, in Powers and Martin's model, one of the proteins is a WW domain, which is a small protein. It's basically a model for protein folding. And already in the Anton simulations, it was there in the folded and an unfolded confirmation. And there are some transitions in between these two. Now, basically, we have both of these structures in there. You, before our simulation, we actually take the Anton simulation as an input. We analyze all these structures, and those are our structural ensemble that we put in. So in our ensemble of 50 confirmations for this protein, we have eight of them which are folded and 42 which are unfolded. And now we can look at transitions between those and basically see how the environment is affecting the equilibrium between them. Now, first of all, we do a contact analysis. These are now all the contacts that just the WW domain is involved. So we can analyze its interactions with every other protein in the system. This is a complicated plot. I call it a Mercedes plot. They basically <laughs> have three bars. One is the number of contacts. One is the overall surface area that you invest in these contacts. And one is the average, like how much area or how many atomic contacts per contact do you actually have. And get a lot of information. You can distinguish basically 
what the WW domain is mostly impacting with. There are two extremes in here. One is this inorganic pyrophosphatase, EPA. And there you see it doesn't have a lot of contact to the WW domain, but whenever it has a contact, it has a significant surface area so that the area per contact is actually pretty large. So whenever they form a complex, they basically grab each other. It's not just a contact with just one atom, but there's actually many atoms. They basically really form a contact interface. The other extreme is this cold shock protein. The cold shock protein forms many different contacts with your WW domain, but the overall surface area is always minimal. So if you look at the area per contact, it is very small. So these are two extremes that we see in these simulations. And then you look into the details of these simulations, you can kind of analyze it a little further. And for the inorganic pyrophosphatase, you extract all the complexes that appear in these simulations and you cluster them. And you basically just get a handful of structures. So whenever these two proteins form a complex, they do it in very particular ways, usually involving a large contact interface. If you do that for the cold truck protein, they form a gazillion of structures which always involves just a few atoms, at least on average, from that. So you have a very diverse set of different unspecific interactions, which don't involve a lot of atoms. So these are the two extremes that you see here, two different types of crowding. Unspecific interactions, basically random, always with just a few atoms, and something a little bit more specific there. For whatever reason, these two enzymes have not evolved to actually interact with each other, but they seem to like each other in a way that then they form a complex that really kind of have a lot of them. Now we were interested in how this environment, this model environment of the cytoplasm is affecting the stability of the folded state of the WW domain. And um, for that, we use the Anton simulations of reference. So that's basically the change in the folding energy is zero. Um, then we see this kind of ratio of eight to 14 that we put into our simulation. We basically see out of 50 configurations of the WW domain, if eight of them are folded and 42 of them are unfolded, that's exactly what we saw in the Anton simulation. Then the change in polyp energy is zero, and I indicate that with this pie chart, and it's basically 50 50. Uh, if you look at this simulation, this is what you get overall in these nine different conditions. This is what you can see if you actually see a WW domain by itself, not in contact with any other protein. You can see that barely ever happens, and also not good statistics for that. But now we can also break it down into all the contacts of all the other um, proteins in the system. Now, this packing density of 317 something grams per liter, that's what was used in the anthrop simulations, and physiological salt concentrations of 150 millimolar. So that's kind of what the system should reproduce if our implicit solvent, slightly coarse grain Monte Carlo simulation and the anthrop simulation are the same, then this should look like this. It's not exactly like that, but it's actually from all the different scenarios that we have in here, it gets closest. So it's not that. Not perfect, but we didn't expect it to be perfect, but it's pretty close. Now, what else do you see? General effects, looking at all the different actions that's kind of tedious, they're not doing that. But if you look, for example, at any kind of packing concentration, so this is highly packed, this is not so packed. If you look at the change in the salt concentration, when you lower the salt concentration, the folded sink gets stabilized. And that first side looks a little bit weird. You wouldn't expect that because the WW domain is um, positively charged and all the other proteins of the system are actually slightly negatively charged. Mm -hmm. So you would expect the system to become more sticky and you increase the salt or decrease the salt concentration, then um, the WW domain and all the other proteins, they should attract each other and attractive interactions usually lead to unfolding. However, because all the proteins in the environment are negatively charged, it also means if you lower the salt concentration, they will try to avoid each other even more. Mm -hmm. That generates actually more crowding because everything else tries to expand and tries to yeah. take up as much space as possible. If you look at the detailed actions, there's one winner here, this elongation factor. That's the one that actually under these conditions grabs the WW domain and stabilizes it most. What that means, we don't know. Yeah. But let's look at this in a slightly different perspective. It's the same data, different representation. I am expressing these pie charts in terms of changes in the folding free energy. And you see certain trends, which are obvious. So these are the different packing densities. This is the different ionic strengths. Overall, when we increase packing density, we are stabilizing the folded state. That is not surprising. Anyone has read the papers about molecular crowding. That's typically what you expect for volume exclusion. 
if you're on a let's say an elevator or in a subway train this is not a concept that is already understood in Phoenix Arizona because we don't have something like this <laughs> but if it's very very crowded you can't just wave your hands and go around but you want to be something like this mm -hmm. so this is how volume exclusion works also in cells if it's very densely packed you cannot just unwind very easily you kind of try to stay like this but all the time it's usually very compact mm -hmm. so that makes perfect sense now this is the ionic strength effect if you are lower bionic strength you're also stabilizing the COVID state that's what I just mentioned all the other proteins are negatively charged so when you lower bionic strength after setting the action becomes stronger all the other proteins want to avoid each other and take much more space so there's less space of a poor WW domain mm -hmm. also becomes compressed and more stabilized but what I think is pretty cool if you look at physiological salt concentrations, 150 millimolar, this impact of the crowding is actually almost none. This horizontal lines, they basically describe the average effect of all the protein in the system. So the overall impact on the WW domain. And while overall, if you look at, for example, high concentration of low salt concentration, the packing has a significant impact, but at physiological salt concentration, the impact is actually minor, almost nothing. So that's interesting. I cannot explain it, but it's kind of weird mm -hmm. that the physiological control concentration, the system is doesn't really care if it's very dilute or very densely packed like it is in the cell. But the stability of the WW domain, maybe also barber proteins, it doesn't really matter, not as much as you would think. That's completely against any theories about molecular crowding, which are out there, or most of them at least. Only people who think about sticking interactions, things like this, and there's actually balance between these two forces. They think slightly differently, but it's kind of canceling like this is new. Mm -hmm. You can also analyze, see that the time is almost up, or actually, basically, up. You can analyze the interactions between all of the different proteins, so not just the WW domain, but all of the proteins of all other proteins are very, very complicated. This is the number of contacts, it's the overall area of every protein and every other protein you have this kind of three by three matrix. But if you just look at the overall context and the area, you don't see anything too interesting. But what you do see is if you look at the ratio, so how big is the contact area for each contact that you observe, then you see an interesting effect. And it depends on which complex you look at. For example, here, again, this inorganic pyrophosphatase, and this ligation factor over here, you see that the trend with ionic strength, this is basically what you see over here, that is pretty pronounced at low packing density. And the proteins are far away from each other. Then electrostatic interactions really matter for what types of complexes are formed. Mm -hmm. While if you are at high packing densities, it doesn't. It's not so sensitive. My explanation for it is if you're at high packing density, if electrostatic interactions are screened after 10 or 20 angstroms by the soul, it doesn't really matter because if your proteins are already within range of 10 angstroms, more salt doesn't really change anything about that. However, at low concentrations, the proteins can still choose how they actually bind to each other. And in this case, you have repulsive overall electrostatic interactions. So the proteins actually don't want to be too close. But now if you increase the salt concentration, you're screening away electrostatic interactions and you form larger complexes with more overall contact area. We also see some examples of the opposite. So again, high packing density, screening of electrostatic interactions doesn't really impact what the complexes look like. But at low packing density, you actually now have basically an electrostatic attraction that becomes stronger if you lower the salt concentration. So you see different effects in here. And of course, most of these proteins actually both of them here are negatively charged. So that seems weird. Why should there be an attractive interaction? But if you have two proteins and they come together, it's really the surface interacting. The total charge matters at long distances. But if you're close, you see all the hydrogen bonding partners and salt switching partners which are close. All electrostatics, but this becomes then more important than the two monopoles essentially in the chart. So this is the tool that we can use to kind of re-enact the all atom simulations, which are really, really expensive, and this is comparison ridiculously cheap. Um, we can resample kind of these crowded simulations. We can use different scenarios. Um, you can vary parameters like any strength, the total concentration of all the proteins, you can vary the system composition, and then analyze basically the impact on crowding and the stability of certain states under different conditions. With that, I want to thank you all for your attention and the people in my group who work on these projects. Funding agencies have actually recent development that is now looking better than it used to be a year ago. <laughs> and I'm happy to join your questions. <laughs>
Thank you very much. That's very interesting talk. So questions? Yes. Uh, a few questions. Um, what is low pack and density physiologically relevant? In the cell, usually not. Like the cells will blow up if you try to inject as much water as you need to go to the low concentrations. So essentially what that result, as long as that's correct, means that electrostatic interactions, I mean, they matter. I don't look at them. Okay, if I count the number of contacts and the overall surface area available, then that has that fields packing density, of course, but the type of complexes, how the proteins, if they form a complex, what kind of complex they form, that doesn't seem to be impacted by the salt concentration very much. If you're already in this kind of highly packed environment, that only matters at low concentrations. It technically is artificial. That's something if you have an in experiments. Um, then I want to ask you in the press, present, present, uh, technique, present, yeah. present, yeah. Um, can you predict or recapitulate E factors? E factors. Hmm. I haven't tried that, but I should be able to guess. Okay. That's actually a big idea. Well, it's because other people have done similar techniques. Uh -huh. So that's why I asked. Um, and then can you clarify the elephant can get a trace of a hashtag? Is that what I understood? So it's not a hashtag. Because the hashtag is something that you calculate based on potential energy. So that's one matrix, one set of eigenvalues, one set of eigenvectors. But what you use in harmonic normal mode analysis, we have a matrix with all the velocity time cross correlation factors. So we have velocities of all degrees of freedom. We correlate them all to each other. We calculate it as a function of delay time. So time correlation function. And that time correlation function is fully transparent. So that's why we have the matrix of all these velocity cross correlations as a function of frequency. And then we can go to any particular frequency for which we want to know what are the motions that contribute to the spectrum. And then it gives you the answer. These are the motions that are there. And 90% of them contribute to nothing. The eigenvalue is zero. A small fraction of them has a non zero eigenvalue, which describes, describes how much kinetic energy essentially is in these cases. So, I have a question. Have you ever tried the first part of your talk about the protein low frequency motion? Have you ever tried to compare this to any type of experiment? So, we were working protein? on it. Uh, so, I already started talking with Andrea Marcos. So, okay. she is in Buffalo. And she has the most um, sophisticated way of looking at these low frequency vibrations in proteins. Mm -hmm. She uses polarized light oh. and protein crystals, which are hydrated. So it's not like dry crystal, right. but more like a gel, but the proteins have a kind of orientation. Mm -hmm. And that way, all the vibrations in your system also have a transition diaphragm that is oriented in a particular way. Now you come with polarized light and you can rotate take them relative to each other. That means as a function of the angle, you are now exciting very particular vibrations. Mm -hmm. And this broad feature of the spectrum that I showed you now becomes actually a series of sharp positive and negative peaks as a function of the angle. So you can basically isolate certain vibrations. Interesting. And Interesting. the problem for her was actually trying to figure out what these vibrations are. Right. And that has been very difficult. But anything to based on harmonic knowledge. Well, obviously, in a crystal, you can, she cannot see all those very large conformational or changes. Sure. Right? For the, for the, and then I have one question about your multi configuration and multi method. So, how, when you do the final simulation of this whole thing, so do you have water? Uh, so, water is implicit. Right. So but then, when you do the parametrization of the model, the proteins moving in water to, to see those ensemble of conformation for which you capture the electrostatic, right? Yes. So do you think that dynamics match kind of bit and low order? Uh, no, probably not. No. I mean, the Monte Carlo, you ignore time. There's no dynamic information. Right, right, right exactly. But you do the conformational change of the protein, right? Yes, but there's not be there's Monte Carlo steps. So it's really just going from one conformation right. to one of the other conformations. How much time it takes oh, for, for that? You don't know. For the conformations, you do okay. You I do see. it instantaneously, and you just say, "Okay, the colors, I see, you I get see, the zone dynamic see. average." You don't know what the dynamics right. are, right. Right. so then Thank you would need to know all these transition rates. Right. 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 Okay, cool. We have a couple of online questions. Yes. Dan, oh. if you want to go ahead. Uh yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, enjoyed your talk, particularly the last part. So I uh, have you ever looked at uh, putting DNA or uh, ribosomes into your of objects that get uh, exchanged? Unfortunately not, not yet. So in alien simulation, there are ribosomal subunits 
Um, we use our input data for our simulation from the Anton all Athens simulations. So there are no rivals from the supplements in there. So we don't have them. It could transplant them from some other simulations of ribosomes so we get confirmation ensembles. I'm a little bit worried with ribosomes because they are really big, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any simulation that can really honestly represent the confirmation ensemble of ribosomes. Mm. Um, but in principle, if you have a few states of ribosomes which are interesting, you want to know how the environment is affecting them. Um, and if you have structures for those, you can plug them in and see what happens. You might have some trajectories around them, right? Yes, <laughs> that's very true. And we also have, uh, we wrote a whole paper on the assembly of the small subunit where we were working with Jamie Williamson. So uh, uh, when we meet tomorrow, I can show that to you. That might be really interesting. Sounds great, fantastic. Seeing okay. the assembly of the subunits would be really nice. I don't know if that works, but <laughs> if it does, it would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. There's one more online, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so hi, with his fans to talk, that's great. I, I, just as a clarification, maybe I understand wrong. So for the last project about the molecular crowding, Oops. Uh, are you, is each protein being simulated allowed to switch the conformation on fly during the simulations? I okay, understood everything acoustically, but so every protein has a set of 50 different conformations mm -hmm. and every Monte Carlo step, you pick a protein, the mm -hmm. protein translates and rotates, and then also we have they a also do a, a new conformation. Yeah. So it and is like, so mm -hmm. for every That's simulation right. step that you also compare a trans of like confirmation transition. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Not three questions. Just one more. Okay. <laughs> the, the PPA and CSP story is really cool. Um, well, is there uh, some relation to function of these proteins? Because I think the whole culture of truck protein, maybe. So the cold shock protein is uh, a protein which is expressed obviously under cold shock. Typically, cold shocks can affect the stability of uh, proteins, and it's, I suspect they act a little bit like chaperones. So there you want many kind of unspecific interactions, and they kind of increase the crowding, trying to stabilize things. Uh, so that could be a relation to the interaction, this more specific interaction between the PPA and the WW main that's branded. That yeah. just shows that there are some proteins that like each other more than others, but I don't think there's any functional relationship. The WW domain is actually engineered to be kind of a model for protein folding. It's not even a real protein, as far as you can remember. It seems like it's more entropic for this entropic contribution for the CSP. Yes. And a random, slightly specific interaction with the PPA is just. These two proteins seem to fit to each other in some sort of configurations. It happens. We have many choices. Oh, Eric. Yeah. Um, nice talk. I like to start with the start about the vibrational study. Um, would, would the results that you observed be sensitive to the choice of the water model that you use, like TIP3 versus 4P, or whether you're using rattle or shape instrument? Mm -hmm. So the water model certainly has an impact on it. It's part of our potential energy surface. How drastic the impact is, I don't really know. Uh, we have, so far we did it at the GP. We didn't play with water models. Um, right now it's even hard. If you run a simulation, the system explores a certain part of the potential energy surface. It pops between certain minima of potential energy. The simulations I showed you are short, like nanoseconds. And mm -hmm. really that is enough to explore new confirmations or new potential energy minima. It's probably just single side chains and they will jump back and forth. But comparing two simulations is actually not so easy. So, because in any simulation, the protein will do slightly different things and will explore different confirmations and different vibrations. So, if you now try to compare one simulation in tip P and one simulation in P water, these comparisons are hard. You need to find the proper length, which is very system dependent, to simulate a protein that it stays within a kind of general ensemble of confirmations, explores all of them. And you get good statistics for the vibrations in each of these states, and then you can compare it to a different simulation in a slightly different environment. But it's not so easy, it's not so material. Mm -hmm. um, your second question, I almost forgot, are uh, uh, restrict constraints. So the simulation that I showed you, I turned them off. Mm -hmm. So we actually simulate all these vibrations. We also decrease our time step accordingly. 
the main reason was to really showcase that this method is able to isolate the low frequency vibrations. Yeah. That I showed you the spectra when you project dynamics on a single vibrational mode, and the only thing that you get is at one terahertz mm -hmm. for modes at one terahertz. If you do the same thing with harmonic normal modes or quasi harmonic normal modes or any kind of other method out there, mm -hmm. you always get this contamination with mm -hmm. high frequency vibrations. It's possible to isolate this vibration that is yeah. only happening in low frequencies. So that works about it. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah, that's not good.